thinking like practical takeaways. Uh, we, so we, we covered uh, some of them. Um, but what would you say this kind of says about the best meal timing? Does, I mean, sh- should w- would it make more sense to do in time-restricted feeding or to spread the protein out? Yeah, that's very difficult to say because this study challenges so much, but I'll, I'll give some of my uh, my thoughts. So my my main background is in sports nutrition, where there was this idea, they don't necessarily care about longevity, they just care <laughs> about performance. And, mm. and so, so there the idea was multiple meals throughout the day is better than uh, less meals, essentially. Uh, this study strongly challenges that concept because again it was mo- mostly based on the concept well you can only use up to 20 grams of protein a meal that just seems completely incorrect um, i would consider that good news because it just means you can be a lot more flexible with your protein intake you don't have to set a timer every four hours to hit some some weird uh, distribution target you still can but you don't have to so i consider that good news now, what for regular people or people with longevity uh, goals? So uh, very difficult to say because my study wasn't necessarily designed for that. But on one hand, my study challenges even the basic concept of time-restricted feeding because it shows that just shortening your feeding window does not necessarily reach your goal. Like whether you consume that 100 grams of protein over a 12 hour period, or you just smoosh it all in a shorter time uh, window, if you're still digesting that meal 12 hours later, because it's the same amount of protein, you haven't obtained your goal of being being fasted. So mm-hmm. one of the most popular intermittent fasting strategies is eat all your food in eight hours and then fast for 16 hours. But if you have a high protein intake during that eight hour period, uh, our study shows that perhaps even after 12 hours, you're still not fasted. Um, mm-hmm. So how long is your actual fasted state? Um, so in, on one hand, my study challenges a little bit the concept of intermittent fasting slash time restricted feeding if you have a very high protein intake. However, it get, gets back to our discussion about the signaling. It does seem that uh, for example, the mTOR signal after feeding is very short-lived. So maybe you're not fasted, but you have reached, if the underlying goal, if we can truly say that the uh, the main mechanism by which either caloric restriction or fasting helps to increase longevity is by inhibiting mTOR, which I'm not necessarily convinced of, but let's say it is, um, then maybe still time-restricted feeding does it based on what what we saw here, that the mTOR response is very brief, uh, even when you're clearly not fasted. Um, With the limitation that we saw that in muscle tissue. So I cannot guarantee that the mTOR response in, say, a liver or in the brain is also short-lived to feeding. So I have a little bit of mixed results. The basic concept of eat in a short time window to uh, to be fasted, that just seems very incorrect. It's more about your total intake rather than distribution per se, whether or not mm-hmm. you're fasted. Um, but the that was just a means to enhance to, for example, inhibit mTOR. That concept still seems to be pretty much on the table. Um, so since you asked about practical takeaways, um, I am not convinced that high protein intakes on their own are very beneficial for, for example, older adults who try to stay either fit or just healthy in general. I really think that protein only starts becoming beneficial when you combine it with physical exercise that, uh, trigger training adaptations, whether it's aerobic adaptations or, Uh, resistance type adaptations and then there's really a use for your bodies to start utilizing that dietary protein so i'm at this point there are some concerns with higher protein diets for metabolic health Uh, i have 
I don't share that concern at all in active older adults. Uh, I would, in the ideal world, I would would like all the older adults to do a lot of exercise and combine it with a relatively high protein diet, nothing absurd. And there, I think the protein will have a benefit, uh, just stimulate lean body mass, which will have so much benefits. Um, if you don't want or cannot do exercise as an older adult, I would stick probably with a relatively moderate protein intake. I don't see a lot of upside from higher protein intakes. It's not, you often hear the claim that it will protect against muscle loss during aging. It's not that clear. And there are some concerns that protein might have some metabolic disadvantages. Also not convinced by it, but I would certainly not make it a blanket recommendation for everyone to have a high protein diet. Okay, so then follow on from that. So what is a good amount of protein kind of per kilogram of body weight? Yeah, so again, it depends a little bit on the target population and their goals. Uh, in the athletic world, especially those who do strength training, often you hear the number of 1.6 gram per kilogram per day, which is two times the RDA. Mm -hmm. Um I would probably recommend the same for older adults if they do sufficient amounts of exercise, whether it's aerobic exercise or uh, uh, resistance exercise. I would probably go a little bit less, like a lot of older adults, uh, not necessarily uh, maybe longevity and enthusiasts, so to speak, mm -hmm. but a lot of older adults who are at least health conscious, they go on long walks. Uh, there I would go maybe a little bit lower, maybe 1.2, 1.3. Um, unfortunately, the average older adult um, who doesn't do that much physical activity, I would focus on making sure you hit the recommended daily allowance of 0.8 grams per kilogram per day, maybe up to one gram per kilogram per day, upper limit 1.2 grams. I wouldn't go above that because there are some concerns uh, with protein intake. And then you're tricking yourself saying like, oh yeah, protein might have benefits if you're not doing any amount of physical activity. Like their first priority is increase their physical activity of any kind mm -hmm. before they even start thinking about protein. So for them, don't be deficient. So it really depends on the niche. So for the longevity crowd, I cannot stress enough, do exercise, ideally both aerobic and resistance exercise. If you do that, then I think a relatively high protein intake is not only safe, but also probably beneficial. If you don't like to do exercise, keep it a little bit more moderate. Does the uh, kind of protein matter, like plant versus animal? Uh, again, depends on what you look at. So for anabolism, um, it can matter a little bit. Um, so very quickly for anabolism, you kind of need two things from your protein. You need it to be a signal for anabolism and you need it to provide the building blocks. Now mm -hmm. that signal function we already discussed, that's mostly the leucine content of the protein because it activates mTOR and the building block, you need all the essential amino acids. Uh, and ideally in a composition that resembles the tissues in your body. Now, unsurprisingly, animal tissues resemble human tissues a lot more than, for example, plant-based proteins. Mm -hmm. So strictly from an anabolism point of view, one gram of animal protein is typically a little bit more effective than one gram of protein, uh, of plant protein. But it's not that huge. Like some people do like, oh, plant protein is useless. That's absolutely ridiculous. Just as a short rule, maybe it's 10, 20% less efficient, but let's not act like that. It's a huge difference. So if you're worried about it on a plant-based diet, eat a little bit more to compensate for the lower quality and you're probably okay. Um, that's strictly from the anabolism point of view, but then again, from the health point of view, uh, in general, too high of animal-based products tend to be unhealthy. Um, it's also because, generally speaking, plant-based, uh, sorry, animal-based products are often heavily processed. Like 
think of what's what's really an unhealthy a, a hamburger, which is a highly processed animal based product. You don't have that. You don't really have that equivalent in the plant based nutrition. So a higher percentage of plant based nutrition, just in general, can be considered a little bit more healthy. Also, there I think it's a little bit exaggerated. I think if you're if you have decent to good nutrition knowledge, um, you will have a very healthy incorporation of animal products in your diet. And likewise, if you have a good um, good nutrition knowledge, you can be a very healthy vegan. What I don't like is either the blanket statements of, let's say, the bodybuilder saying like, everyone should eat more protein, especially whey protein is the best protein, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> That's just such short, like all that matters is animalism. That's just not for everyone's goals, the best approach. Likewise, a lot of vegans um, believe that veganism is the best for everything. It's healthier. It's, it saves the world. Very noble causes. But if you would tell my parents to eat like a vegan, their diet would be protein deficient, low quality. Like a vegan diet can absolutely work if you know what you're doing. So if you are motivated, you can have a very, very healthy vegan diet, but don't recommend it to everyone because the people who go along with the hype will probably be nutrient deficient in, in various things. So does protein type matter? Yes. Um, in general, I like a relatively high amount of protein from plant-based nutrition, but you kind of know need to know what you're doing, especially the groups that are vulnerable for low protein intake. Some animal protein is probably good to keep the overall quantity and quality decent. Right. Okay. So one last question as we have gone over. So would you be able to share what your protocol looks like, your health protocol looks like? Yeah. So I'm, I'm pretty average in that sense is that I have a little bit of overlap with almost every uh, <laughs> community. So a little bit with the athletic crowd, a little bit with general health crowd. Um, so I am relatively moderate. My protein intake is about 1.5 grams per kilogram per day. Um, but I do quite some exercise and my exercise is very, um, 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 diversified so to speak so i do some resistance exercise some cardio some mobility work like i don't have specific goals of benching this much or running a marathon in this time just i want to have pretty good overall health and fitness so i am i'm pretty moderate i don't have like some of my colleagues have extremely high protein intakes because they want to gain every inch of muscle they possibly can uh, i don't subscribe to that uh, we don't really have the longevity people here among my close colleagues but i i'm not necessarily an advocate of heavily restricting either caloric intake or protein or any other nutrient because i don't know if the cost benefit ratio is worthwhile so i'm, I'm pretty moderate mm -hmm. Okay, but, uh, that... yeah, I, can, I can go in more detail, but that's from the protein uh, point of view. I have I consume about one point five gram per kilogram per day, um, and I still spread it out in four meals. So, kind of in this mm -hmm. paper, I suggest that's probably not necessary. But just a uh, normal meal intake uh, is already breakfast, lunch, dinner, and then usually prior to bed, I just take some extra protein. Um, but that's not because I have strong conviction that's either superior for either anabolism or better for longevity. It's mostly convenience, to be honest. Okay. Um, did you take creatine? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I mean creatine is the, the supplement that has, at least in the sports world, by far the most evidence that it's effective. It's also the cheapest. If you just have regular creatine monohydrate, it's the cheapest supplement you can have. Interestingly enough, there's like 50 other types of creatine on the market, which are all, other than that they're like five to 10 times more expensive, they're also less efficient because all these other types of creatine are the creatine molecule with some other thing added to it. 
which means that per gram of product, you have less creatine. So you mm. actually need more of the fancy creatines to get one gram of creatine. So you're paying more for something that per gram is less efficient. Um, so creatine is well known in the sports world, but there's also some evidence. Again, longevity research is really challenging because you can't have long-term longevity research in humans. So it's all based on biomarkers, but there are some suggestion that it impacts methylation and perhaps has some uh, health benefits as well. More recently, there's more attention for creatine supplementation and uh, brain function, mm -hmm. cognitive function. And one I liked is there's some research that creatine supplementation might help with some aspects of sleep deprivation, which kind of makes sense. Like it's an energy carrying substrate. So mm -hmm. if, you, if you're sleepy, there's not enough energy, you could, you could see it. But I consider creatine as a healthy... Uh, compound to take and it's so inexpensive why not just a very in my opinion positive return on investment but i'm kind of curious what your take on uh, creatine uh yeah i, I take creatine because i mean very much the same as you i've heard that it that it is the one molecule that actually has the most research because it's been around for so long that it's safe and um you know it helps with your exercise and if you can do more exercise then you can bigger muscle I mean, so, yeah. so yeah uh but i consider that more of really as a i guess a health supplement other than a longevity supplement uh do you take any other supplements right now uh, i i just from the top of my head i only take um uh, vitamin d and some fish oil but it's mm -hmm. kind of uh, conditional so in the summer i don't take vitamin uh, d official i kind of just take it occasionally when i'm like wait when when's the last time i had fatty fish oh that's a week ago oh, i'll take some fish oil. Right. so i don't follow very strict um supplementation guidelines for example but i am aware you probably want to have some fish oil in your diet and mm -hmm. i'm from the netherlands where there's not that much sun uh <laughs> and actually our group did some research on it that throughout especially during the winter most people are deficient then with vitamin D, you get the whole discussion we had today. What's the optimal levels of vitamin D? Probably not deficient is not necessarily optimal health either. So I think that's a supplement where quite some people can benefit from uh, supplementing. Yes. Yeah, uh, that we definitely hear that. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tromelin. You've been very kind with your time. So where can people follow your work and uh, what you're doing at the university? Yeah, so um, I'm available at most social media as uh, at Nutrition Tactics. Uh, so I have a website and I'm on, say, Instagram and stuff like that. Um, should be more active, but uh, in the last six months, a lot of research opportunities, which has pros, but also cons. Uh, on Twitter, I'm available uh, by my name, which I won't say because no one will recognize it. Maybe it's in the title of this uh, episode. <laughs> Uh, but if you just if you find if you look for nutrition tactics, you uh, you'll find me if you want to. Okay, and yeah, you have a web page with which describes MPS. Like the, in is that on nutritiontactics.com? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Exactly. Yeah, that looks wonderful. I shall definitely link to that. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Tromelin, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you.